the job of the petroleum geologist really has changed over the last several years since we, since we uh, started exploring for Marcellus Shale and the other shale reservoirs. Uh, prior to the rise of the shale, we chased what were called conventional reservoirs. Uh, those reservoirs were sandstones, uh, limestones, and other things, non-shale reservoirs. Uh, the role of the geologist really, as I say, has changed. Uh, the shales are called continuous reservoirs. In other words, a well could be drilled anywhere within that large area, the Marcella Shale, and you can make gas out of it. Uh, our goal now is to identify the sweet spots uh, in the Marcella Shale, and we use a number of things uh, to do that. The Marcellus Shale was first developed and drilled in the late 1800s. Uh, the first Marcellus Shales were drilled along Lake Erie in Erie County, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, these were fairly shallow wells. Some of those were only 300 feet in depth. Uh, they produced naturally. It was quite different, though, than what we have today. Uh, the first modern Marcellus Shale well was the Wrens Unit Number 1, drilled by Range Resources. Uh, it was drilled in 2003 and completed in 2004 in the Marcellus Shale. And it was the first Marcellus well in the entire Appalachian Basin to utilize the new technique of, of large hydraulic fracturing. The first horizontal well was drilled in 2006, also by Range Resources. And it's the combination of horizontal drilling combined with large hydraulic fractures or fracks uh, that has really allowed the Marcellus Shale to become the economic uh, engine that it is today. And it was really in 2008 that the drilling levels started ramping up. And we've seen a continued explosion in the number of drilling rigs uh, and frack crews that are out there right now in the Marcellus Shale. The Marcellus Shale was deposited about 380 million years ago. Uh, it's, it's middle Devonian in age. And it was deposited in a, in a what's probably think we think now fairly shallow enclosed basin uh, there were mountains to the east uh, and the organics the reason the marcellus shale is so good it's got a high organic content and that's what makes it black and in fact you can go in some places for the marcellus shale and pick it up at the outcrop and you get black all over your hands and that's due to the high organic content uh, a lot of people now think that the, the organic content was was due to uh, high amount of algae, perhaps algal blooms that contributed to the, to the large amount of uh, organic content in there. And it was probably developed over a, a time period of perhaps 900,000 years. Uh, and so we have a, a zone that might be anywhere, that runs anywhere from 100 to 350 feet thick, it thickens to the east, and the thickest part of the Marcellus Shale is in northeastern Pennsylvania. Well, let me say that we hear a lot when you read articles, and you hear uh, uh, stories about the Marcellus Shale on the uh, evening news. We often, it's often led by the new drilling technique of, hard, of hydraulic fracturing. Well, it's not new, and it's not a drilling technique. Uh, uh, drilling is done before the hydraulic fracturing takes place. The, the hydraulic fracturing is, a, is what's called a completion technique, which is done after the drilling. And I say it's not new because the first hydraulically, hydraulically fractured wells uh, were done back in the late 1950s. So we've been hydraulically fracturing wells for 50 years now. Uh, based on my own research, uh, we've figured out there have been at least 48,000 wells hydraulically fractured in Pennsylvania alone. Um, and in, in not one case, I will say that there's been one case documented of contamination of the fresh water by hydraulic fracturing anywhere in the Appalachian Basin. Hydraulic fracturing is done after the well is drilled. Uh, we'll typically drill a well uh, to a depth of anywhere from six to 8,000 feet in depth. Uh, at that point, we turn horizontal and drill in a northeast or southwest direction. Uh, and those, those laterals might be anywhere from four to 8,000 feet in length. And then we'll isolate a zone within that horizontal length. Uh, we'll perforate. In other words, shoot holes in the pipe, and then under very high pressure, uh, we will actually split the rock, create vertical fractures that reach out several hundred feet in a northeast-southwest direction, and they also generate uh, vertical height growth. And again, that's typically uh, measured in the hundreds of feet. And we're able to measure, actually, we use things called microseismic 
and we can actually map out exactly where that fracture goes. The risk associated with hydraulic fracturing uh, historically and to date have, have been those that occur at the surface uh, where we have uh, mechanical failures at the surface that lead to uh, uh, pipe rupture near the surface that lead to spills on the surface and there have been a couple of those. Uh, the two in particular, the, uh, the, the largest were actually cleaned up very quickly. Uh, DEP investigated those and determined there was uh, little or no uh, contamination of the fresh water. So that, that is a possibility. Uh, we have not seen to date any evidence that hydraulic fracturing has actually gone from the well bore and communicated up into the fresh water because you see the, the fracturing takes place at a depth uh, greater than 5,000 feet so it's more than a mile in depth. The typical aquifer is anywhere from, it can be as shallow as 50, it's typically not more than 400 feet in depth. So we have a we have a solid rock between where the perforating and fracturing takes place, which is typically, again, 6,000, 8,000 feet in depth, and the fresh water layer that's uh, typically less than 800, 600 feet in depth. We can document uh, that there has been no fracturing, hydraulic fracturing, uh, communicating to the surface, and we can do that in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, there's been no documented uh, cases of that occurring, uh, but again, we can use this microseismic to map out where the, actually the fractures occur. And in my own experience, the most vertical growth I've ever seen in a well bore is 1,800 feet, and that was quite unusual. So, and that well was at about 7,000 feet in depth. So it, that fracture generated up to about 6,200 feet in depth. So again, we were still more than a mile below the aquifer. Um, another way we can look at it here, I, I won't go into the technical details, but at depth we create vertical fractures. Uh, when you get to 2,000 feet and above, due to the loss of overburden pressure, actually the, the fracture gradient changes and now you create horizontal fractures. Uh, it's just the, it's just the uh, uh, physics of hydraulic fracturing. We know that occurs. It's, uh, it's been documented uh, in real-world fracturing examples and in the laboratory. So I, I have to say that if you're going to try and uh, get a, a hydraulic fracture to grow higher than 2,000 feet in depth, I'll say you first must repeal the laws of physics to do that. So we can back this up through hydraulic mapping, hydraulic fracture mapping. We can also look at the hydraulic fracturing uh, theory uh, to, to see that this has not occurred.